Biggie, are you going to come and do my uh, wrap up with me? Are you? Hey, let's go over. Bub 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 bub. Should we show everyone your your toy? Biggie, was she? Bub 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 bub. You're not in the mood for it today. Some of these. Yes. Oh, I can hear you purring. Okay, we'll put some on the floor for you down there. This is basically what the reading vlog, when I start doing the reading vlog, is going to be like. <laughs> just just me talking to the cat. And, uh, yeah. I don't know, raging about this book, probably, because it's... Anyway, hi guys, Dane here, and welcome to my monthly wrap-up. So this is my wrap-up for the month of June 2018. I think I read like 24 books or something. It will presumably say in the title because I'll have totaled it up. It's uh, my list of stuff I read is slightly out of date, but it's fine. Oh, I've forgotten the most important thing. This is for Todd the Librarian. It's also my branded mug, so I have to use it where possible. I know in recent wrap-ups I've been wearing my shirt and suit and stuff. Not doing that today, because it's the middle of a heat wave. I'm actually filming this at 9pm, and it's still very hot. Anyway, without further ado, I'm just going to get cracking. So, yeah, these are all the books that I read in the month of June. So, we start with the pinnacle of literature here. This is The Little Fire Engine by Graham Greene, illustrated by Edward R. Dizone. And this is just a children's book by Graham Greene, who's one of my favourite authors. I mean, this was published a long time ago. I'll read you the blurb, actually. Little snoring didn't seem to need old Sam Trolley and the little fire engine anymore, as much snoring had a brand new motor fire engine with five smart firemen. But it was old Sam and the little fire engine who galloped to the rescue the night of the big fire. Yeah, I mean, it's enjoyable. It's just a kid's book, but um, it's kind of like a like almost like a classical feeling kids book because it's from like 1970 or something uh, in a time when Britain was very different I mean the plot of this is that the, the little fire engine that's being pulled by a horse it gets retired for a motor fire engine and then eventually the little fire engine and the horse kind of save the day it might not even be a horse it might be a mule I don't know but um so yeah, you can tell from that that it's, it's fairly dated in terms of its subject matter, but it was cute enough. I'll give it a 3.5 out of 5. Yeah, it was alright. And I, again, I, Graham Greene is an author who I really like, and he's one of my most read authors. I'm trying to read all of his stuff, as you will see a bit later. So um, yeah, I thought I would... I would read his children's books as well, why not? Okay, next up we have The Book Thief by Marcus Zusak, which I did a full review of this, which I'll link to below. I didn't really enjoy this one. I think it had been overhyped for me. I preferred the movie. We watched the movie afterwards and I thought the movie was a lot better because the problem that I had with the book, and I said this in my review, is it was like cordial or I think America's like, or squash or whatever you call it. I don't, it depends where you're from, I guess. Anyway. So yeah, it was like over-diluted cordial, basically. There were some great ideas to it, but it was just too drawn out. And a lot of the stuff in it just seemed gimmicky to me, like death as the narrator didn't really work. There were bits where he knew stuff and then other points he didn't like. It was very confusing as to whether was he supposed to be omniscient or not. And also he kept spoiling the plot as well. He told you what was going to happen at the end repeatedly. And so you're like, okay. So... The movie was better just because it cut all of that out and stuck to what, at, heart, at the heart of it, is a good story, you know. And for some reason, everyone thinks that I really didn't like this book. I just thought it was okay. I think I gave it a 3.5 or maybe a 3 out of 5. For now, I'm going to give it a 3 out of 5. Uh, yeah, I, I wouldn't bother with it personally. But All right, next we have R. Doris by Charles Heathcote. And Charles is also on BookTube. Is he Charlie Heathcote or is he Charles Heathcote's channel? I can't remember be below anyway but I picked this up for Todd and Dane's indie read along and this is my best indie book of the year so far and spoiler alert we'll actually make it into my best books of Q2 as well it's just very funny it's got like a northern English sense of humor it's a lot like if you've seen uh, Keeping Up Appearances the old uh, comedy with Hyacinth Bouquet it's very inspired by stuff like that but it also has its own kind of narrative voice it's basically about an old woman called Doris Copeland 
who wants to win the local garden safari and her long-suffering husband, Harold, or Harold, he kind of has to do all the gardening and stuff while she climbs the social ladder. Yeah, all in all, really enjoyed our Doris. Fantastic indie book especially. For fuck's sake! So I really enjoyed our Doris. I mean, my copy's signed as well, which is very cool. And also, like, from a layout point of view, uh, Charlie absolutely nailed it. It's like really well done for an, uh, an indie release, which I think is cool. I've actually got book two that I want to get to soon. Laughed out loud a lot while reading this. Would recommend Our oh, Doris by Charlie Heathcote. Charles Heathcote. And I gave that a 4.5 out of 5. Okay, then I picked up Five Go Gluten Free by Enid Blyton. So I actually got this from a car boot sale here, which is it's a bit like a yard sale, except out the back of people's cars. They show up and just open up their boots and sell stuff. So this is a parody of the Enid Blyton Famous Five books. And this one, Five Go Gluten Free, you can actually see them on the cover there. She's using a spiralizer. This is another one where it's got a British sense of humor, but also it's probably not gonna make as much sense to you if you haven't read the Famous Five books. So I was raised on Enid Blyton. I think it's quite a British you know, author to be raised on as well. And so I kind of got the original vibes from this, but also the humour. So um, Bruno Vincent, who writes these, he does a really good job in all of them. And I picked this one up specifically because I've recently gone vegan. So a lot of the situations where they're like saying no to cakes and all of this stuff, it just made me laugh because it's like, it's my life now. So, uh, but yeah, I enjoyed it. I gave it a four out of five. Then I picked up The Martian by Andy Weir, and this was a buddy read. So was The Book Thief, actually, and a few more of these. You may remember a little while back I did a video where I talked about all the different books I wanted to buddy read. So those are all going ahead now, and I'm working through them. The Martian has probably been my favourite of those buddy reads so far. I can't remember all of the people I read it with. I know Brian's Bookshelves was one of them, because this is his book of the year so far, I think. And, uh, spoiler alert, this will also be in my top books of Q2. It's just funny, good sci-fi. I mean, I'd actually seen the movie first, but even though I knew kind of what was going to happen and stuff, it didn't hamper my enjoyment of the book. It was very well written, especially for this was originally uh, self-published before Random House picked it up. It's just a, a good book, and also I think it has like, it has like cross-genre appeal, so I know a lot of people who don't necessarily read sci-fi have really enjoyed it. I'm like a casual sci-fi reader. I'll pick it up every now and then. But yeah, I just thought it was really well done. I mean, I had a few problems with it here and there, but overall I thought it was very good. And I've reviewed this as well, so the link to this and any of these other books, for example, uh, The Book Thief, I also did a review of that. I will link that below. Then we have Five Go On A Strategy Away Day, and this basically takes the piss out of corporate away days. So if, if you've ever worked in a job where you've had to go on like an annual away day or whatever, which I have, then um, you kind of know what this is poking fun at, basically. There's a lot of like, you know, piss taking out of corporate jargon and stuff like this, like ideation and let's touch bases and all the phrases like that which I hate and what's pretty funny about this as well actually is that they bump into the secret seven in like a neighboring conference room and that's from another one of Enid Blyton's uh, series as well this again is obviously actually written by Bruno Vincent it wasn't my favorite of them but it was still pretty good I will give it a 3.5 out of 5 then we have Audrey Lord Penguin Mini Modern number 23 this is the master's tools will never dismantle the master's house and I have complicated feelings about this book because basically, well it says here on the back, from the self-described black lesbian mother warrior poet, these soaring urgent essays on the power of women, poetry and anger are filled with darkness and light. But the problem is, is that they're very much like a process of their target audience. So. For example, she keeps going on throughout throughout this, she's talking about how white women can't be feminists because they only think about white women feminism and they don't think about black women and this kind of thing. Which I think today is known as like intersectional feminism or whatever. Um, I mean, I don't really know too much because I just believe in equality in general. I, I, I try not to subdivide and, you know, I mean, I, this, like, this does raise some great points about equality. Oh, for fuck's sake. This is why you shouldn't record wrap-ups at 9.20pm on a Saturday night in a dodgy part of High Wycombe. Anyway, she, yeah, she does raise some good points. I think I just disagreed in the way in which she delivered them. For me, it was a bit of a turn-off. And it, there's, there's a lot of this kind of brand of feminism about. And there's also this brand of veganism about as well, where 
people basically just shout at you because you don't share their beliefs or whatever and it it just creates further division rather than bringing people together towards a common goal you know like i think what lord was trying to get at is a similar vision to what i have of you know an equal society it's just she also kind of sends out the message that there's nothing that I can do because I'm not a black lesbian mother warrior poet or whatever even the title of it the master's tools will never dismantle the master's house she's basically saying men can't affect feminism it needs to be done by women and not just women it has to be black women like <laughs> and I'm like well so what you're saying is there's nothing that I can do there's no point me trying to do anything there's no point me calling out inequality where I see it oh there we go that has been falling down repeatedly it's sellotaped. It's like my uh, Harry Potter... Uh... I don't know. We're having a fucking shitty old time here trying to record. Every everything is going wrong. I think uh, another problem that I have with it as well is that it's full of, like... It uses too many anecdotes and, like, stories rather than hard statistics, which is what, personally, I find more convincing. I don't know. I find it harder to argue with, like, statistics than... For example, she complains that uh, there's a there's a thing about feminism and she's the only black feminist female speaker there or whatever. And um, I don't know, to me that's just like, but that's one conference. Like if you can show me a statistic that says only 2% of spots on feminist conferences are led by black women or something, that statistic to me is more telling than just a story about one incident, you know. Thinking back to it, I'll give it a 3 out of 5, like... I think it would be much better to read if you were a black lesbian mother warrior poet feminist or, or whatever. Whereas to me, like I say, if the master's tools will never dismantle the master's house, then the master might as well not even bother. Five Go Parenting by Enid Blyton, aka Bruno Vincent. So like I said, I got a bunch of these and was reading through them. And in Five Go Parenting, they basically adopt a child. Now I didn't think I was going to enjoy this at all because I don't like children and I don't even like reading about children. Just, it just doesn't interest me. However, it was very funny and there were points at which like, even though, for example, they went out to buy a pram and I've never had to buy a pram. I could totally relate to the discussion they were having about, oh, this one has these features. Yeah, but this one has these features. You know, that sense of humour, I think, is very, very British, uh, like the rest of them, really. I'm going to give that one a 3.75 out of 5. Why not? Okay, I think I can carry the rest of these in one hand, which is good, because I've just realised I forgot to take a uh, thumbnail, thummy thumbnail. So I'm just going to do this. Let me do what uh, Graham Quigley does, because when Graham Quigley's taking his thumbnail, he does his cheesy grin. So are you ready? Three, two, one. This one's for you, Graham. Oh, God, that's terrifying. I can't use that as a thumbnail. No one's going to click. Up next, we have The Skeleton's Holiday by Leonora Carrington. So this is number 24 of the Penguin Mini Moderns. I'm going to read you the blurb here. These dreamlike carnivalesque fables by one of the leading lights of the surrealist movement are masterpieces of invention and grand grignol humour. I don't know how does that how is that name said and I really enjoyed this I mean she's predominantly like a right uh, an artist rather than a writer But she's a hell of a writer for me. This is like the evolution of something like Lewis Carroll It's like an, a grown-up Lewis Carroll But with kind of other sensibilities thrown in and like the advantage of having an extra 60 70 years of literature or whatever I'm gonna read you the quote here from the front page because I think this will give you a good idea what this is all about Ring for your maid, and when she comes in, we'll pounce upon her and tear off her face. I'll wear her face tonight instead of mine. I just love this. Uh, 4.5 out of 5, and I, I really want to get into some more of Leonora Carrington's writing, but also to check out some of her art as well. And uh, I would recommend this one. Then we have William S. Burroughs, The Finger. And this is a few of Burroughs' short stories. The Finger, the title story. I actually mentioned this in my Five Bookish Facts episode about Burroughs. So I will link to that below. And uh, basically, it's a true story. He cut off part of his finger and gave it to a, a girl. And um, yeah, that's, that's what that story is about. But there are other stories in here as well. Overall, it's a pretty good introduction to Burroughs' work. I think it was more accessible, maybe, than some of his novels and stuff. It's not going to mess with your mind as much. Yeah, I just enjoyed it. And again, I would recommend it, especially if you're a Burroughs fan. Four out of five. Then we have Mrs. Dalloway by Virginia Woolf. And this was a reread for me. I actually reread it via audio for Catalyst Reads Rereadathon. I don't know what I'm doing with this hand. Hello. And... Um, 
This was my most hated book of all time. I was basically forced to read this at university for one of my modules. Really didn't enjoy it. And so I've kind of hated it ever since. So I reread it via audiobook with Becca as well. Actually quite enjoyed it. So uh, I gave this a 3.5 out of 5. I mean, it's not going to become my favourite book anytime soon. But there was a lot to love of it. I loved the character of Septimus Smith, I think his name was. Uh, Mrs. Dalloway herself was kind of boring. But... You know, I've matured as a reader, I think, since I read it, and so, because of that, it was a totally different experience for me, really, uh, you know, I would recommend this book now, I, 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 it's definitely no longer my most hated one. My most hated one, well, my second most hated one of the year is this one, which is The Shadow of the Wind by Carlos Ruiz Zafon, before I continue. The most hated one is... Um, that Stephen Fry book and the Ode Less Travel. That's my most hated book of this year, and therefore of all time because my of all time book got changed this year. So I, I, don't, I didn't have a second most hated book. So now it's going to be that Stephen Fry one. But uh, yeah, The Shadow of the Wind, Carlos Ruiz Safon. I posted a review of this. People disliked it apparently. But what's funny is also a lot of people were like, "Yeah, I DNF that book. I couldn't stand it." I know uh, Mara from Books Like Whoa. She gave it a, just a one star on Goodreads. No, no review as to why, so I assume she DNF'd it. Because this was a buddy read, I ploughed through. I just thought it was slow and boring. Like, I don't know. I found out since it's supposed to be literary fiction. Okay. Uh, I, I don't really do genres, so I don't really care what genre you want to classify it as. It, but it was... There were bits of the writing itself which was enjoyable and beautifully written, but the story itself was dull. There was like this twist at the end, which was super predictable. Daniel, the main character, was awful. Like, some of the decisions he made were really bad. He was like, he... So he let himself into this girl's house and then went up to her bedroom and walked in on her having sex. Uh, but this was the girl that he'd fancied as well, even though she was, she'd kind of shown that she wasn't that interested in him other than as a friend. And then there was another girl who was engaged to a guy, and he decides he's going to pursue her. And I'm just like, dude, stop being like this. So, uh, yeah, I don't want to talk about The Shadow of the Wind anymore. I wish I hadn't posted my review, because then people kept commenting on it, and I kept having to talk about this fucking book. And I just really didn't like it. So, let's, let's move on. Two, Agatha Christie, A Murder in Mesopotamia. I thought I was going to enjoy this one. I actually picked this one out specifically because I'd not enjoyed The Shadow of the Wind. So I was like, I'm going to go with some Agatha Christie. It'd be nice and safe. And it was just all right. I didn't think it was her best, which is weird because it's written during kind of her prime, if you, if you know what I mean. So uh, it was written just, it was the book after the ABC murders. But um, yeah, it was just kind of dull. It was told in first person, but I didn't really get a sense throughout of who the actual person telling the story was I actually forgot and then near the end I remembered he's supposed to be a doctor or something but I was like who is this guy what? so that was weird Poirot was in it but to be honest I've been finding recently I just don't like Poirot like I like the mysteries and I like the writing but I don't like Poirot as a character he just annoys me Miss Marple all the way man yeah it's three out of five it was all right I mean Christie at her worst is better than most at their best. And also, I think part of the reason I didn't like it was because I had a book hangover or whatever from uh, The Shadow of the Wind. All right, then I picked up Lakuma Magazine, issue number 13. And I know this isn't technically a book, but I very rarely read magazines. And even rarer still do I read them from cover to cover, so I'm counting this one. I think I checked it on my book blog because I have a category for, like, fiction, non-fiction, poetry, and then magazines. And this is like the fourth magazine I've reviewed. And the other three were literary magazines. I only count them if I read them cover to cover as I did with this. And this is basically a vegan magazine. So it has like a mixture of recipes and stuff. What I really like about all the fashion is that they're wearing like vegan clothes. So say like, you know, stuff made out of hemp or like faux leather and stuff like this. But it's vegan clothes with vegan food as well. So, for example, here, this model here, she's having free from ice cream from Tesco, along with pineapple leather sandals, which I think is quite cool. And they also have, like, exhibits here. In fact, there's a thing with uh, Bosch, chatting with Bosch. And uh, I just bought their cookbook. So that's pretty cool. Then we have Karl Remarks, and then God created the Middle East and said, let there be breaking news. Karl Remarks is like an online political satirist, and uh, he... This is basically his book. It's from a, a publisher called Saki Press, spelled S-A-Q-I. 
and um, sorry, Saki Books. I think I'm pronouncing it right. I'm not sure. I mean, it's humorous, but it's also informative. And it just focuses on the situation in the Middle East, really. So I'm going to read this little part out, to it, out of it. This is the thing that he went, he went uh, viral for, because he provided the simple one-line explanation for what caused ISIS. So here it is. The failure of the post-colonial elites to create genuine democratic societies and foster a sense of national unity, opting instead for military dictatorships that eroded the potential for economic and political development, coupled with the historic mistakes of Arab progressive parties and their appeasement towards autocratic rulers, contributing to the complete evisceration of alternative political frameworks that could create organic resistance towards external meddling, hegemony and outright military interventions, leaving a radical interpretation of religion as the only remaining ideological platform capable of mobilizing the disenfranchised that was then exacerbated by the global decline of universal ideals and the rise of identity as a prime mobilizer and enabled by political and financial support from theocratic regimes aiming to shore up their legitimacy and made worse by the collapse of the regional security order creating the conditions for proxy wars and political social and economic upheaval intensified by geopolitically incoherent international meddling escalating conflicts and leading to a perpetual state of chaos under which the appeal of a revivalist religious political order embodied by the caliphate becomes attractive particularly when coupled with a millenarian apocalyptic narrative simple so yeah just pretty amusing some good satire here i'll give it a 3.5 out of 5 okay then we have what i read when i was on holiday in berlin so basically every time i go away somewhere i try and take the biggest book on my tbr with me so i don't have to carry around loads of different books so in, in, on the trip to Berlin, I read The Talisman by Stephen King and Peter Straub. I actually read it over the three days, so I started on the way to the airport there. Finished it on the way back from the airport, which is pretty cool. And yeah, I did enjoy this. I know a lot of people had commented on my like Instagram and stuff saying this is one of King's best and stuff. I didn't think it was his best. I said in my review on my Goodreads and my website that... Uh, I wouldn't rank this in his top 10, but I would put it in his top 20. It was also cool to get a bit of Peter Straub, even though, to be honest, it just felt like a Stephen King book. So I'm not sure how much like input Straub had or how they separated the writing or whatever. I would be interested in checking that out. I gave this a pretty solid 4 out of 5. It was just a good adventure story, and it was also pretty cool the way that there was um, the territory. So it was hopping between our world and another world, and I liked how that was done. And uh, yeah, I mean, if you're a King fan, you've probably already read this, but if not, get to it. And I will be reading Black House, which is like the sequel to it, but I've also heard that it's nowhere near as good. Then we have Elephants Can Remember by Agatha Christie. This is another Hercule Poirot book. Unfortunately, this one was also pretty forgettable for me, if I'm honest. I think it's one of her later ones, which is possibly why she might have been running out of uh, story ideas. It followed this like sort of suicide uh, mystery, which unfortunately, it was another one where I kind of called it before the end. I didn't get it exactly right, but I had a pretty good idea of what happened. And I just didn't really engage with the story that much. I, I thought it was ironic that for a story called Elephants Can Remember, it was quite forgettable. And I think I gave it... I can't remember what I gave it, but here I'm going to give it a 3.25 out of 5. It's slightly above a 3. It was alright. The main thing that I like about this is that it has a key on the cover. So if I ever do the bookshelf scavenger hunt again... I've got a book with a key on the cover because I didn't have one when I did it before and it was infuriating. Then we have The End by Samuel Beckett and this is another one where I don't really remember too much of it. It kind of went in one ear and out of the other. No. The eye. The auditory equivalent. I don't know. But um, I mean it was, it was well written and there was some weird and interesting stuff in it. it to be honest it wasn't enough for me to be able to tell you whether I like Samuel Beckett or not and so because of that all I can really give it is maybe a 3.5 out of 5. Yeah, it, it kind of did whet my appetite though. It, it did make me want to read some more of his stuff. But whether I want to commit to a full novel, I'm not sure. I kind of... It, it struggled to hold my attention. But I, at this point, I'm not sure if that was me as a reader or whether it was Beckett as a writer. Next up we have Dirk Gently's Holistic Detective Agency by Douglas Adams. So I read the Hitchhiker's books maybe six seven years ago something like that but i never got around to dirk gently and i've got this and also the long dark tea time of the soul which is book number two and i can't remember where i got them from maybe like a charity shop or something but um at this point after having a few either iffy or not so great books in a row i was just like you know what i'm gonna read this i've been saving this for when i just need a book that i know i'm going to enjoy and i did enjoy it it wasn't as good as the hitchhikers books and it didn't quite make its way into my top 10 books of Q2, 
but it was just outside it. I think I would have ranked it like number 12 or something. And uh, yeah, it was pretty It was pretty good. It was a 4 out of 5 for me. And I am looking forward to getting to number 2 as well. There were a lot of technology references in this that are still true today. And this was written in like 1988, I think, before I was born. And there were like jokes about Excel formulas and stuff. And I'm like... That was pretty forward thinking, like most books from that era. For example, Digital Fortress by Dan Brown is from 1996, and that feels a bit dated. Whereas this is from 88, you know, 30 years is a long time in tech. Okay, and then we're down to my last three books of the month. So the first one I have here is P.D. James, Death Comes to Pemberley. This was a buddy read, another one of the buddy reads that I've been organising. And going into it, I wasn't too sure what to expect, because I've never read P.D. James before. I know my mum likes P.D. James, and uh, I've also never read Pride and Prejudice, and this is obviously like a sequel to Pride and Prejudice. But um, I kind of know enough about Pride and Prejudice from the various parodies and all this stuff that, you know, I know the storyline. And this actually, to its credit, has made me want to go and read Pride and Prejudice now, so I probably will do that at some point. The, my thoughts about this was it reminded me of these, the Enid Blyton books. It was so clearly... Not the original, but at the same time, it felt very true to the spirit of the original in terms of what I have read of uh, Jane Austen's writing. So I thought that was good. To me, it read as though as if Jane Austen had written a sequel that happened to be a detective novel. You know, a lot of people didn't like this one. And, um, you know, I've seen some of the people I buddy read it with, for example, were maybe critical of the pacing, which is true. It doesn't read like a contemporary thriller novel. But it does read as if Jane Austen wrote a detective mystery, you know. Overall, I thought it was okay. I think I gave this a 3.5 out of 5, rounded it up to 4 for, like, Goodreads. And, um, yeah, I enjoyed it more than I thought I was going to do. I also read it a lot more quickly than I thought I was going to. I think it took me, like, three days. It was also a beautiful edition, which probably helped. And like I say, the fact that it's made me want to go back and read Pride and Prejudice can only be a good thing in its favour, you know. Okay, then we have my bedtime book of this month which was Graham Greene Collected Essays. And this is exactly as it sounds. It's just, I think it's 80 of his essays on various different things. So obviously some of them are more interesting than others. And I would only really recommend this if you were a Graham Greene fan. What I think is cool is that he talks about some of his characters. He also talks about some other authors. So for example, Edgar Wallace and Beatrix Potter, Somerset Maugham, Ford Maddox Ford, GK Chesterton. So, I found that some of the essays were kind of difficult for me to take in, and because I didn't really know what he was actually talking about, you know. But, it was easier to read than his collected letters, which is like my last month book, because at least in the essays, you know, it's a complete whole. He's written an introduction, the main body of the essay, and then an outro. So, even if you don't understand what he's talking about, he kind of introduces it, whereas in the collected letters, it's just like, here's a letter he wrote. And it's like, yeah, but who are all these people, you know? So, yeah, it was pretty good. I don't think you would ever want to read this unless you're A, a massive Graham Greene fan, or B, you're, like, writing, like, an essay on him or something like that for university. That said, I did enjoy it. I would give it a, uh, a pretty solid 3.5 out of 5, you know. And the main reason I read it is because I'm trying to read everything that he ever wrote. So, and finally, my last book of the month, this was a surprise to me because I didn't expect to be reading this. It arrived in the post today and I picked it up and actually read it in like five minutes because it doesn't take long to read at all. But this is Bob's and Virgin by Cam C. Wolf. So Cam is Wolf Shop Publishing here on Booktube. And this is basically a collection of thirsty Instagram, com Instagram comments, S but like... In, in a way that parodies Milk and Honey by Rupi Kaur as well. Now, I've never read that book and have no intention of reading it because to me, it's one of those books that people who read it, they're like, I don't read much poetry, but I did read this one and did enjoy it. And I'm like, well, I do read a lot of poetry. So I'm probably not going to, I feel like I'm not going to enjoy it. You know what I mean? It, people have put me off by the number of people who gave it good reviews, but have said they don't read much poetry because it's like, well... How can I trust your review? I'm going to read you a few of these just so you can get an idea of what they are. They are literally Instagram comments. So, baby girl, you're so gorgeous. I'd literally trap all your farts in a resealable jar and take mini whiffs throughout the day to keep me going. Your hair smell like the tropics. That body look nice. Wow, booty so fire. You're my ultimate desire. Booty so clean. I'm a mighty machine. 
A big and mighty machine working for you and doing my things. I'm a mighty machine. You do one more. Your bobs are huge. So yeah, I mean it is what it is. It made me smile, so it also made me despair though. It is quite depressing when you look at the state of humanity. However, for what it was, it was pretty good. Four out of five from me. Good job, Cam. And uh, I, I will actually try and read something that he specifically wrote, because this is, I guess, is like a, co a compilation. It's like found poetry is how I would classify it. But yeah, it was enjoyable. So yeah. And on that note, that is me done. So I think I've only been filming for about 40 minutes today, which is good, because usually my wrap-ups take me around like an hour. As I mentioned in my update video recently, I'm going to be messing around with my upload schedule, uploading a little bit less, probably spending a little bit less time filming, but I'm going to do stuff like a uh, weekly reading vlog and that'll have my writing updates, maybe even some of the food I eat, little bits of Biggie and that kind of stuff. So um, yeah, I am trying to cut down how long my videos are, but some of them, like the wrap up, you can't really cut down unless I did like a mid-month one or something, which I don't want to do. So. Um, yeah, I mean, my weekly reading vlogs will have what I think of each of the books as I go along, so there is that. But, uh, yeah, anyway, that is that is it for this week's reading update. So, thanks as always for watching. Don't forget to let me know in the comments if you've read any of these books, and if so, what you thought. I've just remembered I haven't done my best and worst books of the month. All right, well, worst book of the month, without a shadow of a doubt, is The Shadow of the Wind. I hated this. I literally, I wouldn't reread that book if you paid me, like, specifically if you paid me my freelance rate, I would rather just, like, write a blog post or something. I'd rather just do work than read that book again. However, if you were to offer me in the range of, like, several thousand, maybe I would. And best book of the month, it probably has got to be The Martian by Andy Weir. Although, I will say, both The Talisman and R. Doris come uh, like a close second and third, not necessarily in that order. But yeah, probably The Martian. So let's try that again. On that note, thanks a lot for watching. Don't forget to let me know in the comments if you've read any of these books and if so, what you thought of them. Hit that like button if you've enjoyed this video. Hit subscribe for more and I'll see you soon for another bookish video. Thanks a lot. Bye-bye.